As you can see, the uh, panelists have joined us down here. Yeah, they'll, they'll turn that on for you in just a, just a moment. And uh, so you can see we've got uh, David Rock down here, Charlie Precourt, and Dr. Liz Warren from the Johnson Space Center, uh, one of our Hall of Fame members that will uh, be down here uh, for this. So truly uh, awesome film uh, that we just, uh, we just watched. Uh, we'll get your mics turned on. I'll just open it up with a couple of questions, and then we're going to turn it over to you guys in the audience, and we'll have some microphones for you. So uh, we, we, want, we want this to be... Uh... Okay. There we go. Okay. So, David, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, there are so many space-related... Uh, um, traps in pop culture, movies, TV, comics, video games. Uh, how is advocating for the uh, space challenge in media uh, since the Apollo and space shuttle program? Good question. Uh, well, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Space Camp and the U.S. Space and Rocket Center for bringing us out here for this awesome event. The treatment has been phenomenal. Uh, my team, Melissa and Rich and I, have just been having a wonderful time here and so I want to give special thanks to you guys and the, the whole center, really, for just making this a really, truly awesome experience for us and to bring this kind of full circle, because as you can see in the film, there were a couple of scenes that were actually shot on a little piece of property uh, sort of behind me here uh, in the film. And, and if it weren't for, actually, Tracy sitting right here. Hi, Tracy. Uh, the, the PAO there for uh, ISS Science, who worked with, with us and uh, NASA headquarters to get us permission to actually shoot there, uh, get us badged and everything. Uh, you know, we wouldn't really have had the ending or the knowledge to have the sort of ending that we did. Originally it was gonna be, um, in my mind, sort of a s very morose sort of film. And because and, I didn't know anything about SLS, I didn't know anything about what NASA was doing now. I was pretty much like any other member of the general public, which which, I guess is, to get to your point, uh, the media is just not talking about this new rocket that we're building right now. Um, Rich uh, Evans, who's my social media guy, uh, I don't know where he is right now. Rich, is he in here? Um, he and I would have little powwows in York, Pennsylvania, and we would go to this little burrito place, and there's some young gentlemen that work there, probably 18, 20, 23 years old, or something of that nature. Be, asking us like what we were working on because we were always just so enthusiastic and talking about what we were doing. No clue, these guys. Nice guys, smart guys, interesting, interesting people, uh, but n no clue that we're actually building this, this rocket right now. So, um, you know, we're, not, we're never going to have uh, the, the type of situation that we did in, in the 60s and 70s where we were doing something uh, that was completely and utterly new. Um, but in a sense, that's, that's not true, right? We're, we're still doing things that, that haven't been done before. Uh, you know, we have our sets set on asteroids and Mars and perhaps the moon again. But we also have so many more news outlets and, and ways to get information now that, you know, at that time, if, if something was happening, it was on every channel. It was all broadcast at the same time because there were only, you know, two or three channels that you could watch. Now you're competing with Twitter, you're competing with Facebook, you're competing with CNN and MSNBC and NBC and Fox and I mean, you, you, you name it. I mean, there's some people, if you've got a full package on your, on your cable bill or whatever, I mean, you've got a, over a thousand channels, um, assuming that you're even a, a television watcher anymore. So the challenge is, I think, to to package the stories to be a little smaller, a little easier to digest, certainly easier to share uh, with other people. Um, but I also think that it's, it's really every, you know, especially here, I, I, I'm preaching to the converted, but it's really the responsibility of just everyday citizens, uh, uh, starting with the ones that are in the know, to, to start communicating to the people around them. Uh, the difference is, the difference in their quality of life that the space program has provided for them. And, um, you know, there, there, there's kind of, 
this polemic when you when you talk about when when somebody says, well, what am I? What are we really going to get out of going to Mars? And 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 the, and and the one answer is kind of both difficult and exciting at the same time because the answer is we don't know. And that's you know difficult to explain to somebody that is wondering you know what what, what are we spending this money for? But the exciting part of that is we don't know. We didn't know that the moon was going to give us MRIs and cordless tools and better uh, food safety systems, et cetera. What are we going to get out of going to Mars? I mean, we really don't know. And when you're dealing with a corporate culture or in a culture that's just constantly geared towards, um, you know, saving money and creating jobs, et cetera, and, you know, focused on these sort of, quote, unquote, big picture items, it's hard to take these sort of intangibles and really translate, I think, that into something that's just going to relate to the to the the common voter, really. Um, so, I think I've, I've hopefully answered your question, but um, that that's just kind of the position that we're. I, I think we find ourselves in right now is the difficulty of uh, this new environment that we live in, uh, technologically speaking. That is actually largely given to us by the space program, uh, but it's made it so much more difficult for us to communicate those messages. Good. Thank you, David. Uh, and you provided a great lead-in for, uh, for, uh, for Charlie's question. Uh, what are the next steps after EFT-1 in December? And can we use its success to leverage congressional support uh, for increasing appropriations for space exploration? Oh, thank you. And um, thanks to the Space and Rocket Center and the Space Camp for putting this on tonight. Thanks to all of you for staying so late. It shows your passion and interest. Uh, thanks to David for taking a question that's been on the minds of most Americans since shuttle retired and telling a great story. Um, and I said it earlier tonight, uh, we all, especially this community, since you are part of the space community, we all need to be thinking about how we articulate the why of human spaceflight. And uh, I used as an example the power of inspiration and the product that we get from inspiration and, and across multiple spectrums of our lives. And uh, we all need to think about how we articulate that in our community and outside, because it really does come down to, like David said, the, the, the public, this is America's space program. And the Congress, as you allude to in your question, is, a, is a, uh, a force that can make this happen. And uh, they have been very, very supportive to this point in the program. And um, we are a few years away from making this dream a reality again and having this thing fly. So after EFT-1 this year, um, we will have a number of significant ground tests leading up to the first flight of SLS and towards the tw end of 2017, beginning of 2018. And uh, when you think about it, um, we are bringing together uh, a new infrastructure at Kennedy, a brand new vehicle that is more capable than anything we've ever built before on a deep spacecraft that has, is not your grandfather's Apollo. This is an amazing vehicle that will fly for the first time in December. So I envision being able to tell this story with real uh, results because as he alluded to really well, David did in, in his answer about the media, um, what you see on all these thousands of channels that carry news is uh, once in a while the breaking news thing is what gets on all channels simultaneously. Other than that, if it's not breaking news in the last 15 minutes, it's not there. So we have to regularly and routinely show great success and broadcast that to the deserving public that is supporting of this and then continue to tell a story like he does in the movie about why this is important. We all need to be thinking about why and how we share that with our respective networks uh, because it is so critically important to our future. I think some of the, the, uh, the movie's um, message is a really good one from the standpoint that um, sometimes you don't know what you have until it slips out of your fingers. And that's a good silver cloud in the silver lining in this cloud that we have is that we're all coming to appreciate that we had something that no one else did. It's not, all, it's not lost on the Chinese what happened when they were able to put humans into space. Suddenly all the Asian countries turned to the Chinese as the place to get the best goods in the Asian markets. Um, it's a significant capability to be able to put humans into space and now we are on the verge of putting them into deep space, and that's very, very significant. So we will continue to garner the support of the Congress as long as we continue to perform and share those great new episodes with the public. So. Good, thank you. Uh, 
he, uh, Charlie touched upon the, uh, the Chinese. Almost 20% of our week-long trainees here come from international locations, and China sends the most students to space camp of those other countries. So uh, those uh, families are investing in their uh, young people, uh, just, just that. Well, Liz, uh, you're, you, you're down at the Johnson Space Flight Center, and uh, you've d been down there uh, for the transition from shuttle, working International Space Station right now, and then seeing uh, the Orion program come online. Uh, so how do you see the culture of the space workforce changing as we get closer uh, to true, affordable space tourism? Well, I think the culture uh, is every bit as excited as it's ever been. Um, you know, <laughs> some of the numbers thrown around tonight have been actually pretty impressive. 650,000 graduates of space camp uh, since, since you opened your doors. There's just as many kids that are excited about space. Um, the man in this, in this movie um, is, is you know, like his father said, or like, like the uh, other gentleman being interviewed, there's a million Blairs. And so the culture is very much, we're very excited. What we're doing for our space program, for our nation, for the world, this is very exciting stuff. And the culture as we transition from shuttle to Orion, there's something that is a constant in there, and, and I'm a little disappointed that it sometimes gets left out of the conversation, and that is the International Space Station. And the International Space Station, we like to talk about it in kind of three ways that it's affecting our lives today. There's the international cooperation aspect, which is, which is truly phenomenal. There's 15 nations working together every day in a positive manner collaboratively, collectively to increase knowledge. Um, that is, that's pretty phenomenal and, and um, uh, you know, we've been nominated, the International Space Station has been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize uh, based on that alone, just the international collaboration. As an engineering accomplishment, um, I think people forget just how difficult it is to have a vehicle uh, operating in space. And it is hard. Space flight is hard. And I've been very impressed by our commercial partners who are building vehicles that are taking cargo to the International Space Station and are succeeding. And um, every time I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm holding my breath, I want to see it, I want to see them succeed, and they are succeeding. And this is exciting stuff. It's, this is hard, exciting stuff. And then the other aspect of, of the culture of the International Space Station is the science benefit that we're getting. And science is a little bit tougher because there's a longer lead time. Um, research uh, takes a long time to do. And we, there's, there's a re in there, and the re stand is, is, implies that you have to do things more than once. And that is true. For real science benefits and real science results, you have to have some repeatability. And the science results that we're publishing today and that we're talking about today were actually done during the construction phase of the space station. Um, one example is uh, osteoporosis. We have a drug on the market, uh, got on the market around 2010, and there, the, the drug was tested on orbit in 2001. And uh, that's just one example, that's, that's a long time. And so the, the research that we're doing today, that the crew on, the, on board the International Space Station today, that the people at the Payload Operation Integration Center are working today, or tonight, you know, the crew's probably, the crew's going to wake up in just a couple hours and they're going to get busy doing science. The science we're doing today is maybe five or ten years from, from reaching you and I. So from that perspective, um, the culture of today is a little bit uh, wanting instant gratification. We're, we're a culture of you know, wanting to see results today. Um, but all great things take time and I think it, it behooves us to, to, to remind ourselves that that we are actually growing by leaps and bounds. We're increasing knowledge by leaps and bounds. Things are happening very quickly, but they seem a little bit slow in some respects, too. Um, I hope that answers your, your question, Mike. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, let's open it up now. Um, uh, uh, Trevor's right in the center with a microphone, and uh, so we'll open it up to some of your questions for, uh, for any of the three. So uh, don't be shy and uh, just raise your hand if you've got a question you'd like to ask them about uh, the movie or space flight 
or the space station in general? Um, Charlie Lumpkin. Uh, my nickname is Pumpkin. I talked to a couple of you guys earlier tonight. Um, I'm the cousin of Tuskegee Airmen, uh, Ted Lumpkin. He's a, a documented Tuskegee Airman. Uh, my question for the panel on flight to Mars, and I was talking to someone from uh, Lockheed Martin tonight. The two problems that I'm aware of are radiation and speed. And where are we on those two issues? Thanks, Pumpkin. It was great meeting you earlier tonight, and thanks for your insightful question. Um, part of what the International Space Station is training us to do is to live in space. And in particular, um, a lot of the physiological issues that astronauts have after exposure to space. I had four flights that were only 10 days each, and what we saw through ultrasonic examination was the heart volume shrinks considerably just in that short period of time. Um, and osteoporosis kinds of things start to set in not too long after exposure to, to zero gravity and they're exacerbated the longer you're there. Um, and the exposure to radiation is something that um, much like other radiation exposures leads to cancerous developments much further downstream. So the space station has actually been instrumental in addressing all of those because what we want are crew members that can come back from station and be functional immediately so that when they get to Mars, they can be functional immediately. We want them to come back and be healthy for a long term of life after their mission and not actually uh, contract cancerous diseases that were caused by their mission but die of natural causes um, like they normally would on Earth. So we're making tremendous progress uh, because of the space station and linking that to the ability to sustain life for crew that go and be productive on Mars. It's going to be six to nine months each way. And when you make a meaningful stay out of it to do con and conduct research on the surface, uh, you're talking, you know, um, two to three years round trip, and that's a tremendous undertaking. However, we're going to have crew on the space station here very soon that will spend a full year on orbit, and we expect that they'll come back very healthy because we've learned on space station to provide mitigations, weight-bearing exercise equipment that load the bones that prevent the onset of the osteoporosis issues lining the walls of the spacecraft with special materials that do in fact have the ability to shield from radiation. Um, there, there's a couple of other things to consider about the way we are going about going to Mars though and there's a very interesting coincidence, I call it the perfect storm, uh, of, of uh, situational um, outcomes in about 2030 to 2033. Um, Mars as you know is in a further distant orbit than ours and many times it's on the other side of the sun from us, which puts it some 250 million miles away. But a lot of times we're, we're lapping Mars's orbit because we're on the inside and we're faster, and a lot of times we get much closer to Mars. The closest we ever get is 35 million miles. And so uh, when you look at uh, the future years, the closest we ever get is just inside of 35 million miles, and that occurs in the early 2030s. That also happens to be a time when we see a solar low where the radiation will be as low as it ever gets and uh, we will also have this space launch system in Orion and all the other systems like landers converging in capability to make that an opportune time to go and so I keep telling people they need to keep your sight set on 2030 and all the missions along the way are building to that because it becomes our first realistic opportunity to put crew there in a meaningful way. And um, you know, when Kennedy said we're going to the moon, it was 10 years away. Do the math, 2030 is 16 years away. So it's not that far off. It's no longer a fantasy, it's coming. What about the speed issue, Charlie? Well, the speed issue I mentioned in terms of the transit time, uh, as a practical matter, um, the SLS and the Orion provide the lift um, capabilities to um, I look at speed in a different way. It's the ability to get all of the necessary materials to the surface to support life in a meaningful way uh, for the crew to conduct exploration for a meaningful amount of time. Um, today's launchers would take somewhere in the order of 40 to 50 launches, and by the way, it took us 40 launches of the space shuttle over a period of over 12, 13 years to build a space station. We can't mount a meaningful exploration to Mars if it takes that amount of time to get the convoy set up. So a space launch system builds the capability 
with as few as six to nine, maybe ten launches to mount everything you need to go to get the crew there. And it's very feasible to put all that together in a couple, three year time frame and off we go. So I look at the speed in a different way. It's the amount of time to build the capability to sustain life. And the, the idea that crew can live in space in zero G for up to a year covers the transit time too, as well as the transit time back. And while they're on the surface, they recoup uh, their physical capacity. So we're putting those pieces together to make it all work. Yes, Very sir. good. Okay, next. Right behind you, Trevor. Oh, okay. Right behind you, Trevor. When people go to Mars, if they're going to come back, like, how would they? And, like, how would that work? So, so your, I think your question has to do is how does, what are the systems to get them there and back? Is that what your question is? So uh, what will happen, as I mentioned, it'll take about seven, eight launches of the SLS. Most of those will have large cargo structures in them, such as fuel tanks, a habitat for the crew to live in, a lander to go to the surface of Mars. And all of that system will join up in an orbit out near the moon. And then when it's all put together, uh, the crew will come and join last and take uh, the habitat and the interspace inter transit vehicle to a Mars orbit. And then they will descend to the surface in a lander. Uh, they will then develop, uh, with the help of cargo that gets there ahead of them, a base to, to operate from, and then that lander will serve as a, a vehicle to leave the surface of Mars, rejoin their in-space transit and habitat system to come back to an orbit near the moon from which Orion will bring them back to the surface of the Earth. So there's a lot of steps each way and a lot of systems that have to come together to make it work. Does that make sense to you? Good question. Okay, Trevor. My name's John Chapman, and I was the project manager for external tank during all the return to flight missions after the Columbia accident. I've got a question for all three of you, and that would be, what are your ideas on ways we should build political support for a viable and sustainable U.S. space program? I think it starts with all of us. Um, we, we're voters. And uh, we make our voices heard by voting and supporting technology, engineering, mathematics, STEM education. Um, that speaks volumes. And I think it starts with us voting for what we want to see. And each of us also has a responsibility to um, be out in the community and, and, and volunteering, supporting events such as tonight, um, supporting uh, education. Um, and I think it starts with all of us. And that, that support has to come from, from us. Our voices need to be heard. And um, I think it grows. There's, there's a lot of noise out there uh, about a lot of different things. Um, uh, and we need to be, make ourselves heard. David? Uh, I think a couple things. Uh, you know, again, I think most, most of the folks in this room have already uh, decided probably long ago that space was important and space was something that they were interested in. Um, you know, personally, I was not following or interested in space until two years ago when I began this project. And I began this project from a standpoint of, okay, convince me this is something I should give a rip about. Um, so, you know, in, in through the process of telling the story of this kid, I was going through my own journey of really understanding what it was that that space was doing for, for a guy like me. Um, and the narrative that I'm, I'm, you know, seeing develop now in, in my own personal journey is um, th really through the people that we've been connecting with. And, and, and I did not know uh, when I started this project that there were other, anyone other than NASA involved in building these vehicles. I didn't, I didn't know that. 
I didn't know that there was a company called ATK that's making boosters that, that are going to power this next uh, vehicle, or that there was a company called ATK that built the you know boosters on the shuttle. I didn't know that there were 200 some plus companies out there, American companies that are all making whether it's a, a microchip or a, a, a you know the, the rivet machines or or a hinge on a door, whatever it would be that contribute to the actual construction and eventual launch of this type of vehicle. I mean, I, it's not in the film, um, but uh, th those companies, and you, maybe you can give me the, the, the number, I think it's 44 states? 47. 47 states. 47 states out of 50 that have companies in them that are, that are helping contribute to the construction of this next vehicle. Now, probably most people living 10 miles up the street from that don't even realize that. And so one of the, th the main goals that we're interested in, personally, what we're trying to do to create that, that, that swell, that uprising of interest in um, education is, well, number one, screening this darn thing uh, in as many communities as possible and working with local companies that are involved in aerospace or space, they might be involved in this particular project or, or, or at least they're involved in some sort of engineering um, and really connecting a local audience to what it is to be a scientist, a technologist, an engineer, a mathematician, et cetera, especially if you're working on a project like this. Because if you are a company that is working on one of these projects, then I feel like you have a real vested interest and making sure that our elected officials um, realize the, the goals and, and the dream of the space launch system. So if we can, what, what I hope my team can do is screen this thing in as many communities as possible, work with uh, local companies that are working on SLS and similar programs, uh, bring in the local middle school and high school students, uh, screen this thing, and then do the same thing at night, where we bring in the adults, the voters, and, and really you know, show like, you know, this is the technology that's being made locally. These are, the, the astronaut is the person that goes to space, but there are tens of thousands of people working behind the scenes to get those people to space. And I think that that's the story that really needs to be told right now, is that this isn't just you know, this little group of people working over in Kennedy Space Center that are launching things into space. That's not the reality. The reality is that this is a nationwide effort. This is my space program. This is your space program. And if we want to create the technologies of the future, create the jobs of the future, and the cultural shifts and changes that, that we can't even really even imagine right now, then then these are the kinds of things that we need to know. These are the kinds of jobs that we want our kids to have. You don't have to want to be an astronaut to be in space, or you don't have to be an astronaut to work in space. You can be a welder. You can be in communications. You can be in public relations. And so I think it's really connecting the dots and, and really drawing out what that picture actually looks like, because I didn't know what it was. I thought NASA built the space shuttle. 200 companies built the space shuttle. And 200 plus companies are working on SLS, and I think that that's the story that we need to tell right now. And and hopefully, when I'm, my team and I are are you know at least partially working our way around this country to to, to help tell that story. So at least that's what we're doing. Yeah, I'd just echo that. Some uh, your question really is the one that I found in my um, experience in traveling the country, actually, the world, and giving talks about my spaceflight experience, the di most difficult question to answer is why. Um, and uh, at the you know, risk of repeating myself, I took a, ch a hack at that when I gave a TED talk earlier this year. If you go to YouTube and it's great, you know, by the way. put YouTube pre-court TED talk and just take a look and, and see what you think of my effort at saying why, um, it is really tough to answer that question because there are so many different interests in our society. But we as a community can create a campaign where we can touch all of those interests. And we can show that no matter where you are as an American citizen, the space program impacts you. And so it, in my mind, it, the answer, direct answer to your question is our community needs to be an army of campaigners in different uh, spheres of influence. Um, we all ought to be ready to answer that question why in our own way to the audience that we're talking to. 
So when we're talking to astrophysicists, it's about discovering the origin of the universe. When we're talking to the engineer, it's about building the next great machine. When you're talking to the average American, it's the impact of inspiration that touches us so that the guy in the factory floor that just took a piece of metal off a turning lathe that's going to be inside of a turbo pump that turns at 60,000 RPM, holds it in hand, his hands and recognizes that astronauts' lives are at stake with what he just built. Guess what? We just raised the bar of our industrial base capacity to remain leaders in aerospace in the world. Well, I just touched on one piece of our society there, but our community is capable of articulating what this means to everyone in the country. So each of us has to be able to answer that question and carry the campaign. Part of the campaign is his film, part of the campaign is the, the industry primes that are out there uh, recruiting the next generation of workers and then showing, showcasing the progress we make. Part of the campaign is the leadership in Washington who frankly are thirsty for us to help them decide where to go next. We need to help them lead, that, lead the way. So there's, it's just such a multifaceted problem. I can do nothing but say it's a campaign that we all need to be a part of. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. We have uh, any other questions? Right down front here. Um, mine is more of a comment and reaction to what you were saying. There's a saying in the South that to put the hay down where the goat can get it. And if you are going to uh, energize Washington, you have to educate the public and <coughs> let them know how important that is. And I cite, because I'm really fascinated with what Dr. Barnhart and his strategy there's no place I can go, no media I can look at, where I don't see what's going on with space. And what, was, what is critical is what I call extension. I attended a lecture on the Hubble telescope. As a layperson, there's no way I'm going to get that information because I don't have that contact. But this, to me, is what agricultural extension is. The U.S. Space and Rocket Center is space extension. And I think they're doing some really dynamic, innovative things and getting the world word out. And also it's a multi-layered issue because it's generational. They teach six-year-olds about space. Uh, teenagers, they're reaching out to me to let me know what's going on. And I think there's a model that exists within the U.S. Space and Rocket Center where they're educating the community because those emails I know have to go all over the world. So if you're energizing people who are, in, who are interested in space, you have to let them know what you're doing. And on those multiple platforms, which I think the U.S. Space and Rocket Center is doing. That's why it excites me. Very good. Thank you if for I, those if comments. I, if I can just say yep. one, one thing, you know, kind of bridging off of what I said earlier about all the forms of media that are out there right now. You know, like the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, for example, or the Smithsonian, Udvar Hazy, Air and Space Museum, like those are all great if you live near them and, or you're going to pass through them. Uh, but we need to figure out a way um, to creatively, I think, to connect people with that experience when, when, the, when they can't get there. And I think that's, that's a little bit more difficult, and I think that that's what's going to require a more creative approach to, to really communicating with people that just simply don't have that down the street. Yes, but I understand that I'm, I don't want to belabor it. But what I'm saying to you is the, the, the media goes through uh, Yes, give her the mic. She's saying some good things. Thank you. Um, the media goes, reaches everyone. It's like ether. And um, even though it's here. I was sitting at the table tonight with a young man who found out about this event, was in the area and came here. What I'm saying to you is I think by their utilizing all forms of media, they are reaching people. People become interested. They become invested. Uh, you have the platform. Uh, the key is to get those messages out there. I don't think they just have to be here, though it is important. But I think you can still reach people who will be tweaked by what's going on. Absolutely. 
Liz, I will give you the final word here. <laughs> I, will, I will just add, um, I, I very much appreciate what you're saying, and I think it's absolutely true. Um, to echo what Michelle Hamm was saying earlier tonight, it's all about inspiration. And inspiration is so powerful. Inspiration takes people who are, you know, in, in dire straits and gives them hope. And, and so inspiration can be a great tool. And when we, when we share what's going on in our space program uh, with our friends, and then, then we start to build advocacy. You, s you start with interest. You know, we're all interested. Most of us here probably are advocates at this point. Um, and then, then, then you start building more and more support, and then that starts to spread. And, and I think it's all about inspiration. And 650,000 space campers uh, can't be wrong. You know, what, what the U.S. Space and Rocket Center is doing and what Space Camp Turkey and what the other campuses about Space Camp are doing is, is inspiring. And maybe we're not all going to be rocket scientists, maybe we're not all going to be doctors and engineers that work on the space program, but that inspiration is pretty sure it's lifelong. Um, and so all of us should, should share that inspiration. And, and it, I think it's just absolutely important for, for our young people especially, and <clears throat> for us who are a little bit older to make sure our young people uh, don't give up on science and math because it's hard. Um, I think I see a little bit too much of that lately. I, I see a, lot, a little bit of, of us falling behind in our education standards and, and, and we need to not let that happen. And, um, and a really good way to continue to inspire people is to have really hard things that we want to do as a species. And so that's one of the great things that our space program offers. And it's intangible. You can't put a dollar figure on what that's worth. But that intangible <clears throat> aspect of, of wanting to do hard things and wanting to learn, um, that's one of the greatest things that we have. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, David Rock, for this wonderful film. Charlie Precourt, ATK. Dr. Liz Warren from the Johnson Space Center. And then in the back for our Alumni Advancement Board for helping to arrange this showing tonight and putting this together. A lot of them were up at uh, EAA's uh, Oshkosh uh, uh, last week for, for all of that and helped out up there. So, uh, well, And I'll just mention that uh, ATK is bringing us out to uh, Clark Planetarium in Salt Lake City, Utah on the 23rd of this month. So uh, if you guys know anyone that are out in that area, please direct them to that event. We'll be screening an IMAX, an even bigger screen than this. Yeah, very good.